Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dharma siblings, it's good to see you. It strikes me that we really are greatly fortunate to be gathered together here at this time. How, how lucky uh, to be able to come to a place like this, which is in so many thorough details set up for exactly what we aim to do. A place so very conducive to studying the Dharma. And it's a beautiful day. And amongst the group here, there are people with such a wide range of experience in Zen practice. Some of you have been practicing for decades and have done literally hundreds of sessions in different places at different times. And for some of you, this is your first day of session ever. And for all of us, very fortunate to be here. As I was <laughs> beginning to write notes for this talk, I wrote the following, and I will share it with you because I thought it was amusing. Dharma talk. <clears throat> Zen is great. <laughs> Do it harder, not smarter. Or maybe actually do it lovingly. So here we are on the first day of session. Maybe it's exciting. Maybe it's daunting. Maybe it's all of that and other things as well. Probably we are still in a kind of settling in. Probably we are not fully tuned in yet to the energy and the process of session. Perhaps uh, for some of us, the, the to-do lists that we were feverishly working on until yesterday morning have not yet completely faded out of our awareness. Uh, perhaps <laughs> Perhaps the pain has not yet reached the peaks that it will reach. Uh, for me, the enormous knot of muscle under the left shoulder blade is not yet at a level of pain that I would characterize as unmanageable. But don't worry. As I was packing, yesterday morning, getting ready to come here for session. In addition to the general stress and hurry of trying to get ready, I felt some resistance in my mind, which I have felt before getting ready for session. This idea that, not an idea, this feeling you know, that I'm not ready to leave yet. <laughs> there are still things I need to do. There is more laundry I need to do. There is more putting away I need to do. The talk is not ready yet. And it occurred to me that in a way, getting ready to go to session is kind of like getting ready for your own death. It happens at a particular time, whether you are ready or not. And chances are you are not of the many session I have done over the years, many times I have felt this, just never quite being ready. And I think it's a lot to do with the ego mind's unwillingness to give up control of what I am doing and how I'm spending my time. Because from that opening ceremony, we plunge in to this structure where the schedule says what we do, the bells say what we do, and you have to give up your agenda, which part of the mind is reluctant to do.
So perhaps we'll, perhaps now that we're here, supported by the structure, in addition to being railroaded by it, we will be able to let go more easily and settle into it. Many years ago, one of our esteemed Sangha siblings told me, well, if you ever have to give a Dharma talk, people really like to hear autobiographical stories. Tell them something about your life. They connect with that. So I thought I would give that a try. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm hoping that most of you have not yet heard the story of how I became involved in Zen. People ask me this sometimes at Shoboji, how I got involved in Buddhism. And the, this is a story that is about 20 years ago, and it, uh, it begins with a lot of Roman Catholic uh, foundation, a lot of Roman Catholic upbringing. Um, I was raised Catholic. My parents are Catholic. They are still very active in their parish, the same parish that I grew up in when I was a child. And truly, all of the formal school that I ever went to was Catholic school. I went to Catholic elementary school. I went to Catholic high school. I went to a, a Jesuit Catholic university in the middle of the Midwest in Omaha. And I liked it. I, I was pretty enthusiastic about it. In high school, I did stuff with campus ministry. In college, I went to Mass. I didn't have to do that. Uh, I was involved in the Center for Service and Justice at my university. Um, and worse still, I was a theology major. <laughs> so partly this is, you know, an apology. If it, if it turns out that we discover that Zen talks by me involve some references to the Bible or to Catholic theology, maybe that's why. Um, but the shift was, I'm pretty sure, in my junior year of college. And to me, this is the interesting part because it's a part that I cannot, <laughs> I cannot really explain looking back. I don't know how I came to these thoughts, but at some point, in my junior year of college, I must have been thinking strongly about the issue of faith or belief. And faith is a big issue for Christians. It's very central. And I, I must have been asking myself uh, what I thought I really believed. And thinking about these things, somehow I came to the conclusion that in reality, you can tell what a person actually believes by what they do, by how they behave. Are they walking the walk? What kind of walk are they walking? And in addition to that, studying theology on purpose, uh, I, I came to believe that what this Jesus Christ fellow was teaching was, in fact, a fairly radical call for transformation of one's life. That he was asking his followers to make a radical shift in what they were doing. Among other things, this involved giving up their attachment to wealth and power and comfort and putting their trust in something else. But when I looked around at the, the conduct of myself and my friends at the time, almost all of whom professed to be Christian, it didn't seem to me like we were really living out this radical transformation. Uh, it seemed to me like we were mostly interested in whatever party was happening on Friday night or whatever exam was coming up next. Um, it just didn't feel to me like like we were doing it the way Jesus meant it. And 
<laughs> and this bothered me a great deal. Um, somehow this was deeply unsettling to me and I felt like looking at my behavior, I had to conclude that I didn't really believe the things that we said we believed. And going further, I concluded that for the sake of integrity, I had to stop going to church. I had to stop calling myself a Christian. And this is where I pause because in hindsight, that seems like kind of an unbelievable thing to do. You know, I, I don't know if I can really remember the mindset that got me there. But it is what happened. Uh, I stopped going to church and <laughs> yeah, and here I have a note to myself. There's something about remembering this story. On the one hand, I think of this transition as being such a pivotal shift in my life. And on the other hand, I have to ask, is that person me? <laughs> I mean, not just because it was a long time ago, but who is that person? Who did this happen to? Who made these decisions? So I left the church, uh, but this was highly upsetting. Uh, I'm not exaggerating to say that Catholicism had provided me with my whole system of meaning up to that point in my life. And, you know, that's how I, I evaluated what was good to do, what was uh, meaningful to do. And I felt lost. I, I, <laughs> I really felt like I was kind of falling, like I was grasping around for something to hold on to, something to, like, build a new... <laughs> philosophical foundation out of, and due to, we will say, coincidence, uh, in the course of my Catholic theology major at this Jesuit Catholic University, uh, we were required to take one course in non-Christian religion. And you can tell already what class I was taking at the time. So I was taking this, this class, which I think was literally called Buddhism 101. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this, uh, this, my friends, is why you have to be so vigilant against heathen teachings, because <laughs> look what can happen. <laughs> so I found myself enjoying this class in Buddhism. I was really into it. I, I was actually looking forward to the things we read in that class. And I found myself particularly drawn to the readings that we did out of the Zen tradition. Something about the, the simplicity and the stark aesthetic appealed to me. And uh, I also really respected that Zen Buddhism seemed to be particularly careful to remember that the wisdom we are after the wisdom we are talking about is beyond language, is not, cannot be caught in the language. And so I felt like there's this sense in Zen of keeping that truth very close to the chest. I'm sorry, microphone. And the, the, therefore, the, the art of somehow indicating that truth without getting stuck in the words was very important. And, and during that class, there was a, a Soto Zen monk uh, who lived in Omaha at the time. And he visited our class. He talked a little bit about Zen with us. He had a temple. Uh, and I went and visited the temple a couple of times, practiced with them. And it kind of, <laughs> kind of went on from there. But during this, during this turning point, when, when I left the church because of difficulties with faith, it was very important to me that I could go to this Zen temple and I did not have to show up professing any particular creed. You know, this was part of the Catholic Mass. Every time we recited, we believed so, 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 so. That was kind of the hang-up 
But with Zen, that was not necessary. Instead, there was a method. And I was invited to try the method, to practice the method, without necessarily believing in one thing or another at the outset. And that, <laughs> that doorway was critically important. So speaking with you today, um, for better or worse, I want to talk about what I think of as two basic stages of practice. And first we're going to do a quick overview of what I think this means. Um, so the first stage I think of as being kind of an inward facing stage, a focus a stage that is focused on one's own self, one's own practice, one's own development. And the second phase is perhaps an outward facing stage where there is more of a focus on working for others, helping others. Um, so if I draw this distinction, on the one hand, you have taking care of yourself, figuring out your own affairs, getting your own affairs in good order. And on the other hand, you have taking care of others starting to be concerned about people beyond your own little self. So putting it another way, phase one, working out your own salvation, getting enlightened. Phase two, showing others the way, teaching, helping other people. Or in the very old Asian parlance, we could say phase one might be a phase of being a guest and phase two might be a phase of being a host. But here, before we get deeper into this, there is the important disclaimer. You know, we set up these two phases, right? So I've built these concepts for you, but we know they're not real. We're sitting in this room, we're breathing. There are no phases to anything. So, what does this first phase have to do with? What does this first stage of practice involve. I said it involves taking care of your own affairs. And I think that's a good way to put it, sort of getting your own life in order so that you yourself are in good working order and can then be of some value to other people. And, you know, I often visualize it actually in terms of the the boundaries around the self in the zendo. You know, we have these cushions, we have these zabutons, right? And in a very simple physical sense, part of my initial practice is to make sure that my garbage, my inattention, my selfishness does not spill over from my cushion onto my neighbor's cushion. And we begin practicing this in, in the simplest, most concrete ways, you know. When you sit down, you tuck your robes in under your knees so that my sleeve is not taking up a third of my neighbor's cushion. Uh, when we sit in the dining room together, if we can, we sit seiza, kneeling, because we are more compact that way. So we're not sprawling ourselves over a larger piece of the table. I hope during the course of this talk that there will be some underrunning theme about how the simple concrete things that we practice together help us to express these sort of, let's say, larger abstract ideals. So there's this first phase, which has something to do with becoming aware of your own boundaries in relation to the other people you're practicing with and not dumping on them, not leaving messes, not, you know, leaving your own personal water bottle lying around in the dining room. Uh, you learn to, to sort of bound yourself so that there is a space for others. And again, it's so simple. It's so elementary. But every time we sit together in the Dharma hall or in the Zendo, each person has their own space. And that allows us to be together harmoniously. Such a simple way. You never notice it. But if it weren't that way, what would it look like?
So there's a strong theme in this first phase of, I wish to learn not to be a burden to others. I wish to learn to be sufficiently self-reliant so that I am not making things harder for other people. And again, we practice it in very simple, direct ways. You know, when we leave an event here at the monastery, we clean our rooms. We make sure that there's not a trace of us so that it's easy for the residents to set up for the next thing. And in another way, we're mindful of our pacing. So when we eat or drink together, when we share tea in the zendo, we try to make sure that no one else is waiting on us. We try to make sure that we're ready for each moment of the process, whatever the process is. We're there to participate when it's our turn and then we settle our own turn so that the next people can go and so that the Sangha doesn't get held up by one or two people. This is a, a common Zendo Sare event where someone who is newer doesn't realize the briskness of the Rinzai practice, takes a full cup of tea and the tea is searing hot and they have to sit there for several beats drinking it while everyone waits. This is normal, it happens, we all understand. And another thing I think about talking about this sort of inward facing phase of practice is appropriately, I think this is quite analogous to the first of the three trainings of the historical Buddha. So in the Buddhist world, uh, we are aware of the noble eightfold path, right? These eight factors that the Buddha taught us are the path to the end of suffering. Um, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. When I teach the intro class on Thursdays in, in New York City, I often say, I often present to the students that we group the Eightfold Path into three trainings, three, you know, three groups of factors. And the first training is a training in morality or, or ethics which has to do with the middle factors of the path, right speech, right action, right livelihood, okay? And it's very sensible that this is the first training because when we embark on the Buddhist path, we, we recognize that the whole point of this endeavor, the whole point of all of what we're doing here and all of this effort is to diminish and eventually eliminate the suffering of sentient beings, the suffering of individual human beings, and also whatever other sentient beings are capable of suffering. And so we recognize if that's the purpose of all of this, then it's important not to cause suffering for others. Like it's a very sensible first step. I'm trying to end my own suffering, so I'm not going to make your suffering worse. I am not going to harm you. And so so this first training of the Buddha is, is remarkably similar to what I think was the basic, the basic watchword of, of all of Hindu ethics as well, which is this concept of ahimsa, non-harmingness, do no harm. Step one, don't make it worse, okay? So when the Buddha elaborates on right speech, right action, right livelihood in the old scriptures, it's really mostly a list of prohibitions. You know, it's I will not kill, I will not steal, I will not deceive, I will not uh, commit any sort of sexual abuse, I will not abuse intoxicants, all of these simple things. I will not make my livelihood in a way that necessarily involves causing suffering or oppression for others. And so, kind of in the same way, we establish these these boundaries around our own action so that our own practice, our own lives <laughs> don't dump on other people. And that's kind of where it all starts. That's a good basis from which to begin, right? So this inward phase of practice, we get ourselves in good working order. We begin to learn not to be so self-centered, which is easy to say. 
And then, as we continue working on this inward facing phase of practice, I think there's a very important part which becomes the turning point, but there's a very important part which has to do with developing gratitude for your life, developing gratefulness that you exist and developing gratefulness for the practice. Because, you know, when we begin a practice like Zen, there is certainly a, a notable element of discipline. And it can be easy to complain. It can be easy to grumble. Uh, you know, I know this. You know this. It's easy to say, oh, I am uncomfortable. I am, I am suffering because the rules of this place are so damn strict. Uh, and my knee hurts and I want to get up and can't we have a cookie and sit in an armchair? Um, but at a certain point, we hope to we hope to experience experience this gratitude and and i think in the classic zen term we talk about kensho we talk about true seeing seeing your true nature what does that mean and why does that make us grateful for something well up until two days ago, the, the scroll that was hanging in the zendo at Shoboji was a scroll brushed by Soen Nakagawa Roshi that says, Mu Jin Zo, which you could translate different ways, but one of the translations is limitless reservoir or something like storehouse without end, without bottom. And I think about that phrase, that scroll a lot, when I think about this turning point of beginning to see our lives differently. You know, when we enter the practice, we probably think of ourselves as being relatively small and relatively limited and relatively different from each other, right? Separated from each other. And at a certain point, some of those boundaries begin to melt. They begin to dissolve a little bit. And we are able to touch something that doesn't have these limits. We're able to touch something that doesn't have these constraints, this narrowness. And that's so important. We, we find our treasure. There's this parable in, in at least one of the Gospels about a merchant who is seeking a pearl of great worth and spending his whole life trying to find that one pearl that is so valuable to him that he's willing to sell everything else he has to get that pearl. There's a story right after that in the same gospel about a person who happens upon a buried treasure in the corner of a field and they realize it's worth so much that they go away and they sell everything else they have so that they can buy that field and unearth the treasure. And I think these are not such dissimilar concepts. We once we find that treasure, once we find that limitless reservoir, then things are different. Then we're rich. Then we know we're rich. Then we know that we have something to give. We know that we can give and give and give without feeling impoverished ourselves.
So I wanted to say more about this gratitude. For me, sometimes it can be helpful to think about how vastly, inconceivably improbable our lives are. How unimaginably improbable it is that each of us is the particular person that we are right now. Our, our lives, another way to think about it is that our lives are gratuitous. Before you were alive in this form, eons of nothingness as far as you're concerned. After you are alive in this form, eons of nothingness as far as you are concerned. And that, I think, in some real way, is our default state. Nothingness. And the universe doesn't owe us anything in that state, pure potentiality. There is no particularity about our existence. And somehow out of that state arises this, which includes each of us. And we have a chance to experience something for some years, maybe. But all of that, all of that is, I still think the best word is gratuitous in the sense that it is overabundant. It is superfluous. It, it is overflowing. We don't deserve it. We're not owed it. There's no contract that says, you know, I will get to be alive and relatively comfortable and relatively easy about things for 72 years or anything. Each of these moments is extra. I, I also like to kind of visualize the, the coming and going of of beings, the coming and going of any, any being that you care to describe uh, as a sort of a firework, as sort of a bursting into existence out of non-existence and, and then a fading back into non-existence or you could say arising out of potentiality and then fading back into potentiality. You know, and as far as we can tell, that's what the whole universe is doing. As far as we, we are able to understand, the universe just explodes out of nothing. And we're living in that explosion. But if you visualize, you know, any plant, any flower, any tree, any animal in sort of a time lapse, playing back the course of its life very rapidly, it starts as, as little seed somewhere and then stretches out for a period of time and then fades back away. And this day, this talk is just one little on a part of the arc of that explosion where we're able to perceive things. And even, even if you look at the arc of one human life, your own life, when you're very young, you don't perceive much. You don't have much consciousness, much awareness, much faculty. You don't remember much of it. And depending on the way your life evolves, it can be the same at the other end. As you get toward the end of your life, it's totally possible to find yourself again in a state of having relatively little ability, less clear perception, less faculty, less consciousness. And there's this little bit in the middle where if we're not asleep and we're not too drunk, we're able to see things, we're able to think things, we're able to make choices. And it's I guess I think it's worth noting that that's kind of rare. So let's say that you get to, or you begin to get to this important turning point. You begin to get to a place where you feel 
solidly grateful for the opportunity that you've had to engage in this practice and you get to feel solidly grateful for your life, for the fact that you exist in this form. You begin to find your treasure. You begin to get rich. And when a person starts this practice, you know, when a person walks through the door at Shoboji or here or anywhere for the first time and they do their first couple of sits, I always really hope that they get to this place, that they get to a place where they feel grateful. Because then everything, everything shifts. And one simple way to think about this shift is, is ask yourself, when are you more likely to be generous? When are you more likely to give something away? When you feel like you have a lot? When you feel rich? Or when you feel like you have very little? It's so much easier to give when you have this sense of abundance. And I think that's... So, so getting to the point where you know that the practice has made your life better, that's this important turning point. You know that the practice has made you less prone to suffering and anguish. You know that the practice has made you a better listener, more able to focus on your work, whatever it is for you and you feel that gratefulness, then we can pivot. Then we can start to talk about this outward face, facing phase of practice, this outward facing stage where, you know, just like you find anything that you're excited about, it's very natural for you to want to share it with other people, right? You know, I found this band that's awesome. You should hear them. Uh, you know, I found this Zen stuff and it's really great. You should try it. And, you know, again, disclaimers are important. I'm not, I'm not talking about like a proselytization or, or an evangelization where you're just going up to everybody you meet and being like, Zen is the best. You need to come now and do this. That's not really the point. The point is, is beginning to feel a natural inclination to... I want to help make this practice available to other people. However they find the practice, I want to be, I want to be sure that the practice is possible for them in all of its material needs. You know, we're so lucky to have this place. We can sit in this building, which was built for this. But of course that takes upkeep and the form takes upkeep. And making the food takes effort. All of that stuff. Somebody has to do that stuff. And at a certain point, I have found for myself, there is this natural inclination. I want to make sure that stuff happens. I want to be part of making that occur so that we can gather like this. So that we can share this kind of time and this kind of endeavor together. So... What is involved in this outward facing phase? Well, if the first phase has a lot to do with working on yourself, the second phase has something to do with, oh my gosh, there are other people in the room too, sitting next to me. And what do they need? What are they going through? So, you know, now you're able to look to your left, look to your right and say, how can I, you know, how can I help? Uh, and again, there are a lot of very simple things in our practice that allow us to, to get a little bit of a feeling for this. When you're here for the first time, you know, it can be a struggle just to figure out when do I need what sutra book? When do I need my teacup? Uh, what page are we on? And, and you try to figure that out for yourself. And then at a certain point, you ought to know that for yourself and you ought to be able to help the person next to you. You ought to be able to say, oh, this person is lost, page 16, in a gentle way.
So we start being able to help. We start being able to serve. We start being able to maybe teach. And teaching can mean a vast variety of things. It can mean teaching someone that page 16 is the page we're on right now. Uh, or it can mean all kinds of other stuff. But there's this strong theme of taking care of things, uh, taking care of people, taking care of things, taking care of the place. Um, once upon a time, I had the opportunity to go to a, a weekend seminar at, at Zen Mountain Monastery across the Catskills. And it was interesting for me to observe how many aspects of their community life were very familiar because they're very similar to ours. And, you know, one of the periods of the day was a very familiar period, which we call Nitten Soji, where we have, everybody has some kind of a cleaning assignment and we, we take care of things around the building by cleaning stuff, putting stuff away. Uh, over there, they called it caretaking practice, which I thought was a good name for it in English. Caretaking practice. They have a monastery, they have to take care of it too. So everybody participates in that. Obviously, one way to think about this is serving. And in our ritual form, there are innumerable opportunities for different people to serve other members of the Sangha, serving tea, serving food. And, and there's also a piece of it that has something to do with taking ownership or taking responsibility, right? And in sort of a, a larger abstract sense, there's an important part about taking responsibility for my life. I'm not experiencing suffering and unhappiness actually because of external conditions or because of other people telling me things that I have to do or not do. I'm not really experiencing suffering because so-and-so is angry at me. I have to take responsibility for that. Um, I had a teacher once who said that it was, it was a very important realization for him to realize that in fact, he was responsible for all of his suffering. And that in fact, that was extraordinarily good news because it meant that he could change it. Which is true. If the real cause of your suffering is external to you, can you do anything about it? <laughs> can you fix it? So, so there's, there's this part about taking ownership, um, taking responsibility. And, you know, part of it is taking ownership of, of this monastery, saying, you know, this is my monastery, not in the sense that, that I possess it or I have any control over it whatsoever, but in the sense that I'm going to take care of it. I'm, I'm going to try to become a host. Uh, I'm going to be one of the people who helps make the monastery happen, helps make the events happen for the sake of others. And I wanted to comment a little bit. There was a disappointing moment last night when the Jisha asked for volunteers for dinner cleanup. It's kind of understandable if the officers don't volunteer because a lot of them have other responsibilities at the same time. A lot of them are desperately studying for whatever the next event is, trying to make sure they know what to do. And it's also kind of understandable if the people here for the first time don't volunteer. What do they know? But if you're wearing a rakasu and you're not an officer, volunteer for everything. Help. Jump in. Especially if you have any idea how to do the job. So, if we're able to get in touch with this source of energy, this source of key, if we're able to feel this upwelling key that is the result of our practice such that we are energized to 
serve others, to help. I, I just wanted to call to mind a couple of examples that I, I feel like I've encountered in different arenas. I saw a documentary one time that was just a series of interviews with major world religious leaders. You know, they talked for a while with the Dalai Lama, they talked for a while with, um, what's her name? Amaji, the, the famous hugging saint. Um, they talked for a while with one of, the, one of the most senior patriarchs in Orthodox Christianity. And the interviewers noticed one interesting commonality in their conversations with all of these people, which is that all of them slept relatively little. <laughs> and why is that? <laughs> well, I think part of it is because, and many of them said so, said as much, because they found so much value, so much need, so much meaning in the work that they did with their congregations that they were motivated to show up every day. And, you know, if, if there is such precious interaction to be had, why waste your time sleeping? And I don't know, maybe this helps, maybe it doesn't. But I wanted to comment on how I, I feel this tension in my own practice nowadays. You know, sometimes I do feel the Zen key that is somehow a result of the practice I have done. And I, I feel this very natural motivation to, to serve, most specifically the Shoboji Sangha, because that's where I'm at. But, you know, so I, I, I feel this urge to, to plan more events. I feel this urge to open the doors more times a week. I feel this urge to make sure I am as prepared as I can be for the event that's happening tonight. Um, I feel this urge to clean the temple more. I feel a sense of embarrassment knowing that the altars there are very dusty right now. Uh, and at the same time, I, I feel this, this opposing small-minded urge to be lazy. Uh, you know, I feel this small-minded possessiveness over my time. I've always been very protective of my free time. I'm by constitution an introvert, and so how I recharge emotional energy involves being alone. And so right now, where I'm at right now, my life unfolds in the midst of this tension. On the one hand, I want to do as much as I can. That means a lot to me. On the other hand, where is the boundary exactly between a legitimate and wholesome need for some kind of recuperation and rest? And on the other hand, just the ego mind's very small-minded desire to get its hold on more time and to just like stamp this little guion was here stamp on another hour of my life and say, I decided what I did with that time. I don't know, but that's something that I wrestle with. So speaking perhaps most specifically to those of you who, who are or have been resident practitioners here at the monastery, The, the practice life of the monastery, particularly the hosting schedule, uh, offers you a lot of opportunity to practice service, you know, to do these very simple things that we do for others. We clean, we cook, we clean again, we cook again, we clean again, we cook again. And we do those things partly so that visiting groups can engage in some practice that they come here to do. And that service, and that service work is of great spiritual value. And 
most of my residential years at the monastery were some time ago now. And at that time, during the summer period, the hosting schedule was quite demanding. Uh, we more or less had a guest group every week or every weekend. And so every week was the same cycle of cleaning up after the people who just left and setting up for the people who are just coming. And it was exhausting. And, and I wanted to comment on, on how I think there's a, a curious aspect about the way this training environment is set up, or at least has been set up at certain times. We were more or less compelled as residents during those times to, to work well beyond our own natural inclination to give of ourselves, you know, out of this sense of overabundant love, right? So you work, you work, you work, and, and, and then you get tired and grouchy and you keep working. And you clean and you cook and you perhaps grumble at the unfairness of it all. I certainly did. And at certain times when this training machine was functioning well, I felt myself prompted to ask, when I am compelled to give more than I want to give, to work past the point that I want to, what is the hindrance? What is actually holding me back? And keeping the company of that question, I, I want to submit for your consideration that the Zazen practice alongside this working practice, the Zazen practice is the catalyst. The Zazen practice is the, the digestive enzyme, if you will, that allows this service work to be transformed, to be transmuted into something valuable. Because it's not, <laughs> if Zazen were not part of the experience and if teaching were not part of the experience, uh, if we were just a, a ragtag band of people running a strange Japanese flavored hotel in the woods, we would not expect that to lead to spiritual growth. That would be the same description of, you know, some sort of slave labor and would be entirely ignoble. But when we have this mix of work practice, of sitting, of receiving teaching and the teaching is not really received in, in a strictly intellectual or conceptual way. The teaching is part of the environment and as you sit, your heart mind steeps in that environment of the teaching and these uncomfortable experiences of being expected to work, to give, to serve beyond what you feel pleasantly inspired to offer, that experience also sort of rattles around in your gut as you do the sitting practice. And the combination of these factors, I think, allows this discipline, this shugyo, this hardship to somehow alchemically be converted into a more pure heart, into a lighter heart, into perhaps wisdom, And, uh, and there is something I think distinctly, there's something about the particular genius of Zen at work here too. It, it's not that we 
sort of start at the easy end of the pool necessarily. We start by saying, oh, you're here, it's your first day, so you must begin immediately to manifest loving service work. You, you begin by having to demonstrate, having to express what might be thought of as an advanced result of the path. And that might not be the order we would put things in if this were just the, the rational Western mind setting this up. But that's the order it happens sometimes. So. So I'm... I'm trying to say that as we develop a heartfelt gratefulness for what we've received, we very naturally turn to try to give that back for others. And, you know, honestly, I think the best word for this is love, but that word is used so much in so many different contexts. What does it mean? <laughs> you know, obviously I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about love that has very much to do with kind of unexciting labor. And for my, for my years of thinking about it, at least for today, I think that, that my working definition of what love means is to exert yourself to work for the sake of another being's holistic, long-term well-being. I don't know, maybe you like that, maybe you don't. And I think, I think maybe one of the, the best examples is the love of a parent for the child because it involves a lot of work. It involves a lot of feeding and clothing and, and doing diapers and driving them around and so forth, which you may not always want to do in the moment. Uh, and it also involves not really expecting any sort of return. It's not like your child is going to do the same things for you um, as part of some equal agreement. <laughs> but as we talk about what it means to love, what it means to serve, what it means to help others, I want to really stress that it involves specifics. It involves knowing something about the person you're trying to serve, knowing something about the person you're trying to love, or the inanimate object you're trying to take care of. Every being, whether it's that incense burner or Eno san or the drum or a plant, every being has its own particular nature. And to take care of it has different requirements from one being to another. Uh, you can all think of your own examples very easily, but the first thing that came to my mind was the concept of taking care of a plant. You know, you can't take care of a cactus the same way you take care of a water lily you'll kill one of them. And so you, you have to know at least a little bit about what are the actual needs of the person or the thing that you're trying to serve. You know, I mentioned parenting before. You have to know tons of specifics if you're gonna take care of your kid. You have to know if your kid has a peanut allergy for one. You have to know what they like, what they don't like. You have to know what they're good at, what they're not good at. And it's the same for any person. So if, 
if serving is part of what we practice, to some degree, we have to get to know each other in the particular. Because we don't all need the same things. Certainly not at the same times. Each one of us needs different things at different times to make it even more complicated. And I, I have thought about this question of particulars, specifically with respect to the Shoboji Sangha. And please understand, I am not saying this to criticize any person at all. But I think maybe at certain times in Shoboji's past, the norm of the practice there leaned a little bit too far in the direction of just showing up and sitting and leaving. And of course, sitting is absolutely vital. It is the catalyst that makes any of this work. But you know, if the whole mantra is just sit in silence, that's the only thing. And people come in the door and go upstairs, and put on a robe, and come downstairs, and sit. And then go upstairs and take the robe off and leave. There's not much connection there. There's not much building of a Sangha bond. And maybe that practice is very rich for some people. But I do think it's important for us to get to know each other. It's no accident that the Buddha included the Sangha as one of the three treasures. And if the Sangha is just sort of this nameless, shapeless, group of people in robes who are around you while you do your practice. I don't think that's really the best case scenario. So if I'm saying that, that to take care of someone or something, requires that you know a little bit about its particularity, its needs, its characteristics, then I think that means that as we launch ourselves into the, the joyful practice of trying to take care of ourselves, our Sangha siblings, our temple and monastery, it calls us uh, to become really curious about everything because we have to learn about everyone we encounter, everything we encounter. Obviously, we don't have time to do some sort of in-depth study of every object we touch, but it does challenge us to be curious, to be inquisitive, to be perceptive and open to getting to know the people and the things that we live with. You know, and I'll, I'll say some simple examples that seem dumb, but you know, this lectern thing it's very good at some task. It's very good at holding these papers. It's a very bad hat. And if I approach it from the wrong frame of mind, that interaction is not going to be good for it or for me. Right? You know, this object, perfectly good at certain applications. Terrible raincoat. So I have to be at least minimally perceptive about what I am engaging with. 
I think all the officers sense this at some point when they pick up a new officer role. Suddenly you have to play an instrument. You have to strike the Han, you have to strike the Daike, you have to strike the Boncho outside. And you have to get to know the instrument because you absolutely can strike it in the wrong way. You can strike it too hard in the wrong place at the wrong time. And someone else can tell you what the right way is and that's very helpful, but you yourself have to develop a feeling for it. You have to develop a, an intuition, a knack for it. And I wanted, I don't know if this is something anybody is thinking, but tucked in here, I wanted to address what feels like a common critique of Zen. I do sometimes hear people say that formal Zen practice has no heart. Where's the gentleness? Where's the compassion? Where's the love? Where's the softness? And at least from my perspective, it's baked in. It's one of these things that you might not notice because it is so close to you. You might not notice your nose because it is right there on your face. You might not notice that our formal practice includes in it hundreds of these little occasions of practicing service, practicing care, practicing attention for the people around you. And a lot of them are very simple and very concrete. And yes, they're formulaic, at least at first. But the practice is, the formal practice, is so thoroughly infused with these opportunities that you don't always notice it. The Jisha kneels down to pour tea for each of the other participants. The Tenzos cook our meals. The Tenzos exert themselves in no small way to make the food nutritious and pleasant tasting and colorful and nice to look at and served on time. And they put their care and also their skill into that activity. The Tenzo not only shares with us their time and their physical energy and their effort during the session, they also share with us the cumulative benefit of all of their past training in that activity. And as we become possibly a little more sensitive over the course of the session, we taste it. We can see. So I've spent a while talking to you about what I think may be two conceptual stages of practice. And here I want to bring, bring us around, of course, to another Christian quotation. There's, a, there's an idea from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, at least as it's presented in Matthew, which has been a very important idea for me for a long time. And I'm sure you know it already. But it's Jesus saying in Matthew 7, verse 18, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a rotten tree bear good fruit. So by their fruits you will know them. And 
if you need the words to be substituted for you, a good practice cannot yield bad outcomes or bad conduct. According to Shakyamuni Buddha, his teaching of the Dharma is a teaching that is, quote, good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. And so it's quite clear, obvious even, that the outcomes of our practice, the manifestations of our practice, or to put it simply, our behavior, should be good in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. And just as college-aged Stefan came to conclude that you could tell what a person really believed in by how they conducted themselves, this aged Gyun feels fairly strongly that you can tell something about the quality of a person's spiritual practice by how they express it, how they behave, how they act. And for many, many years, this has been an important lens for me to try to evaluate any kind of philosophical position or would-be religious teaching or policy proposal ask myself, what are the outcomes? What would be the practical results of doing this? What are the fruits? This past week I've been forced to think, you know, maybe you had some privilege and you worked hard and you got a little lucky and you became a Supreme Court Justice. And you write legal opinions, rulings, because you're the highest court, based on your best understanding of what you think are the best philosophical principles for interpreting the law. But what are the fruits of that? If your legal determination, does it lead, sorry, in your legal determination, does this lead to greater freedom, greater happiness, greater harmony in society, greater justice? Or does it lead to confusion, animosity, hardship, suffering for thousands or millions of people. And if the fruit of your policy is destructive, re-examine your policy. So in our practice, putting aside whatever we say we believe, whatever we think we understand, however many years we've been practicing, what are the fruits? What are the results? Are we still distracted? Are we still inconsiderate? Are we still selfish and small-minded? Or have things improved? Are we a little calmer? Are we a little more attentive? Are we a little less stuck in our own concerns and a little more able to notice the people who are right next to us? I hope that for some of you, particularly those of you who have been practicing for a while, you can point to the shifts in your life and you know certain things have gotten better in the sense that now you are better for others. 
for myself at a certain point, I noticed that I was able to be a better listener because of Zen practice. That especially when someone was upset with me, when someone was angry with me, I was more able to hear what they were saying because I felt less of an, an immediate need to assert my own opinion. So there was more of a gap there where I could try to actually understand what they were telling me. Has your practice made you rigid or attached to ideas about the right way to do the form? Is the practice making you hypercritical? I have known practitioners who found in Zen practice a justification for reinforcing feelings of inadequacy that they already had within them. I have known Zen practitioners who found within Zen practice a justification for reinforcing feelings of superiority uh, and anger that they already had inside them. That's obviously not what we're here for. But we have to keep an eye on our behavior. And we have to keep an eye on the time. So, what I am trying to express to all of us today is one of my aspirations for our Sangha, one of my hopes for our collective maturation together. And of course, it's another quote from Jesus in the Gospel of John, as Jesus was addressing his disciples shortly before he was killed. He said, By this, everyone, you, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Which I think is my aspiration for any spiritual community of any stripe. I hope that people who meet us can tell that we're doing something worthwhile because we take care of each other, because we serve each other, because we love each other, understood in this it's about work sense. That's what I hope people can perceive as they encounter our Sangha. So, let us allow ourselves to settle a little deeper into session together. <laughs> 